it's always this competition with yourself to be the best that you can possibly be. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Went inside, hit the bag down, and it was like, as I'm passing dude by, I'm like, woo! And <laughs> why would I go to Stanford? You know, I'm a captain at Cal, you know, at, at Berkeley. He said to go get the best master's degree in the world. Hard to pass on that one. <laughs> I said, all right, little brother, <laughs> you making some sense. I had a season and an injury seven years straight up until I got to Stanford. I'm an underdog, right? I was undrafted, you know, mud boy. I got to be that much better than the next guy. Started doing that with the different platforms and got money in different places. And now with the properties and, you know, all overall investments, really what I'm doing is diversifying. Like, you know, we got this guy on the team. He's 38 years old. If it was me, I'd come in and I'd beat him out. I'm like, you talking about James Harrison? <laughs> Normally I have everybody introduce themselves, okay. tell them about themselves real quick, and then okay. we'll kind of get into it. So go ahead, tell me who you are. That, um, my name's Brennan Scarlett, born and raised here in Portland, Oregon, uh, Central Catholic Ram. Go Rams. Uh, Several state championships here in, in the city. Uh, if you know, you know. <laughs> Went to Cal for four years, played three years of football there, played my last year at Stanford, um, won a Rose Bowl, Pac-12 championship, the whole thing. And then went uh, undrafted to the Houston Texans, played for five seasons with the Texans. Then went to the Dolphins, played for two seasons in Miami, uh, and then been a free agent this year, still train training, staying ready. I uh, run a nonprofit called The Big Yard here in Portland and uh, got a creative agency that I started a couple years ago. Fire. I'm running the Beast Guard TV podcast. Yes. Shout okay. Out so to the squad. we have a lot to unpack. <laughs> I'm excited because you didn't even talk about like your investment aspect mm. and the other parts that allow you yeah. to really amplify how good of a person you are through your foundation and mm. all those other things. Yeah. yeah and yeah. those things can, you know, help you as well. So I'm excited to talk mm. about all those things as well. Uh, but, you know, we always got to start with the OG, tell me back, paint the picture. Us back in middle school, we was up in the same era. <laughs> Tell me what the fits was like. Tell me what the kicks was like. What was your knowledge around finance and the home lifestyle, siblings, everything like that? Kind of paint that picture for me, young, you know, middle school beast car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was a big Marshalls man. Okay. I'm going to tell you right now, Marshalls, the Nordstrom Rack, mm -hmm. those were my two go-tos. I had uh, coming up sneaker-wise- my shoe size mm -hmm. was in accordance with my age all the way up until I was 16 years old. Okay. So at, when I was eight years old, I wore a size eight. It That's was nine, crazy. It was 10. And at the time that I surpassed <clears throat> size 13, it started getting real tough out here to mm -hmm. get sneakers. Mm -hmm. It was real tough. Back in the day, it was Zappos.com. <laughs> yes. It was Audible.com. And then it was the back racks at the Nordstrom Rack. Yeah. That, those were my only options. So yeah. I wore a lot of Sperry's, a lot of Vans, a lot of basketball shoes. You know, they were pretty inclusive in the basketball <laughs> genre. Uh, but now it's gotten a little bit better. So, yeah, back in middle school, man, it was uh, it was skinny jeans for a little bit with the Vans uh, during the Little Wayne hype. The you jerk remember era. That? Yeah, you remember <laughs> that. Um, and it's evolved over the years. It's evolved. Okay. And you got two siblings? Two siblings, yeah. I got and a little brother. Grew up with your mom sister. and dad. Yeah. And uh how was that kind of foundation to your lifestyle with your parents? Because some people grow up with one, some people grow up with neither, some come <sighs> grow up with both. Yeah. Bro, I was so blessed. Um, I had my mom, my dad, I had both pairs of grandparents. I just had a really strong support system. And so from the beginning, um, you know, both of my parents played a really critical role for me. It was like, number one, <clears throat> I felt like I could accomplish anything that I wanted mm -hmm. to, anything that I set my mind to. Like, my parents did a really good job of framing our lives, me and my siblings' lives, in such a way that, like, anything is attainable. Mm -hmm. Chase your dreams. And... um that really stuck with me. And there's, there's one thing that I always, I always tell this story, like of my dad, <clears throat> when, uh, whenever me or one of my siblings would say the word can't, mm -hmm. like, ah, oh, man, I can't, I can't do this, this conditioning test, or I can't do this homework, or I can't do this, whatever the can't was, mm -hmm. he would stop us like, nah, 
Right. We don't say can't. We don't say can't. Okay. And that was the type of uh, mindset and then the, just the support system through any, everything that I did, sports, school, all that. So me, I always have a question too, like <clears throat> how did, what are some, that for sure, but what, what do you think were some things that also your parents may have said or done that made you feel like that invincible or whatever that you were like, ooh, I want to pass this on to my kids one day? Mm. <clears throat> That's a good question. Um, well, I think that number one, as, as far as like just letting me understand that there's nothing that you that you can't do, that you can't uh, achieve. But then also like I think the the ethics of hard work mm -hmm. and just, uh, you know, it's one thing to want something to happen. It's a whole other thing to go and make it happen. Mm -hmm. You want to be a great football player, a great hoop or, or the fastest guy on the track, but are you willing to put in the extra work? <clears throat> and I feel like for me, a lot of, a lot of it was just like seeing it. And I was, uh, my dad ran track at BYU and then he uh, ran professionally, ran in the Olympic trials up in Canada in 1996. Okay. And so I was born in 93. And so for my early years, <clears throat> I saw the way that he was at the track. He was training, you know, he would work for eight hours in a day at the city of Portland. And then afterwards he's hitting Dunaway track, mm -hmm. you know, Saturday he's up at Lincoln, him and his buddies are training. <clears throat> and so I saw that uh, when I was coming up. And so just kind of inherently I understood like, okay, if you want to go do something, you it's, it's not enough to want it. You actually just, you got to go make it happen. So I think basically, I think, I guess the, the point is like, it's more than just what you tell your children. I think it's, it's what you show them in your Leading actions. By example. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Okay. So now you get into middle school and you still like, basically your parents is like coughing the cakes for you as they can. Yeah. For when sure. does it become like, you got to pay for your own stuff? Like, cause oh, for bro. me it was sophomore, well actually low key freshman year, but sophomore year definitely. Was like, really? Yeah. So I'm gonna be honest. I wasn't the biggest sneakerhead in high school. I was more about hats. Okay. The the flat bib New Eras. I was a seven and, and five eighths. You know, when I had Afro, I was seven and three fourths. <laughs> but that was what I liked to go by. They, they used to be like twenty four ninety nine at yep. lids. The lids at the mall. The Lord. <laughs> yeah, I used exactly. to go every Friday yeah. and get one, bro. Yeah. I used to go up there during lunchtime. We had a game that week. I get a new fitted. <laughs> I'd be out there, bro. I, I I vividly remember those times. Man, I used to love that, bro. And we used to. I was like me and one of my good boys, you know, uh, Dimitri, he's yeah. my best friend, uh, coming up, and we used to get each other a hat for Christmas. That was like our thing. And for me, I like always wanted to have a, the collection of all the all the fitties, the different colorways and stuff. So I really wasn't buying sneakers like that any sneakers that were purchased my parents would take care of me okay christmas for christmas or for any basketball shoes or whatever it wasn't until college that i really started to get into purchasing my own sneakers okay yeah okay so high school comes around this time how many were we one year apart yeah we yeah. was one year apart because so, you graduated in 2010 right yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah. so we're one year apart uh we we're playing against each other in high school i went to grant you went to central uh but you went through some injuries. Mm -hmm. How did you uh, kind of deal with those injuries? Because I had my torn ACL in my sophomore year, and I had a, I had a struggle. Like I was messing up in class. Like I just was like, I was identifying myself as a football player mm. and nothing else. So I yeah. kind of like, what am I gonna do? Yeah, like you know what I'm saying. And mm -hmm. I just started messing up in school, and then I had to get back on track junior year. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember those were uh, heavy times for me. Like. Sophomore year was the first time that I had an injury that ended my season. Um, I had a knee that required surgery, and I was out for like six months. And then junior year, I had an ACL. So I was out for pretty much, you know, I was out for the rest of the year. Senior year, I broke my collarbone. It's injury after injury for me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I remember the, the first time that it happened, or maybe even the second, every time that it happened, like it was – always a questioning of like why me mm -hmm. you know like questioning my my faith you know i went to catholic school coming up so like questioning god and you know why is this happening to me mm -hmm. um and then you know i think that like where i really found a lot of solace was 
in my schoolwork mm -hmm. because I wasn't able to compete on the football field and on the basketball court. So I started to compete in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And um, that just was kind of ingrained in, in my nature. And I think back to my parents, I kind of supported that ed those educational pursuits. So, you know, they were always tough times of getting hurt. But then, you know, I also leaned into like <clears throat> this, uh, this philosophy of coming back faster, stronger, mm -hmm. coming back better than you were before. Mm -hmm. And that being the challenge, right? So, you know, in this, it, it was always this growth mindset of, can we get better? And so that with that setback, after kind of like understanding what, what that is and going through the, you know, the sorrow and all that, it was like, okay, well, I was, I was at this level before I got hurt. And now I've dropped down. I can't even walk. You mm -hmm. know, I'm crutching around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but fast forward six seven eight months i'm gonna surpass that level that i was at before mm -hmm. i like that so what did recruitment look like um so sophomore year sophomore year i went to a rivals football camp it was like uh the taylor barton camps mm -hmm. up in uh i think it was in washington <clears throat> and before uh, before this like Coming into high school, I was a hooper. Mm -hmm. My whole elementary, middle school, basketball was my sport. Uh, it was the sport that I watched the most, I knew the most about, I was most skilled in. Okay. You remember. You, you remember. <laughs> <laughs> you Bruh, remember those times. We used to be hooping <laughs> since way back. Yeah, I remember. Uh, and so it wasn't until high school that I started realizing, you know, stopped growing at 6'4" every other power forward and center kept growing. Mm -hmm. Like anybody who was destined for the next level, we're going to 6'9", 6'10", 6'11", whatever. But then I remember watching the NFL Combine <clears throat> my freshman year of high school and seeing guys out there who were 6'3", 6'4", playing outside linebacker, playing tight end, running 40, you know, 40 yard dashes, 4'7", four, 4'8". Four, you know, at that time in high school, I was probably, I was, around the same thing you know mm -hmm. four eight <clears throat> so I was like damn i can actually go and be that mm -hmm. i realized that my ceiling in football was just much higher than mm -hmm. in basketball so at that point um uh, my coach at central coach pine and my parents we kind of all aligned and was like hey you got a chance to go play at the, the next level so you should start hitting some camps so i went to the taylor barton camp it was this lineman camp and we uh they had us do some drills run some 40s, do some one-on-ones. <laughs> and I remember this is like probably one of the first time that I did one-on-ones as a defensive lineman. <laughs> and uh, I I remember coming off the line and I uh, hit this tackle with just the straight hezzy like I had a basketball in my hand. <laughs> 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 Went inside, hit the bag down, and it was like as I'm passing dude by, I'm like, woo, hit the bag down. And... Uh, <laughs> you know, jog back or run back to the line of scrimmage or whatever. And at, coming out of that camp, <clears throat> they put me on the right, the front page of the rivals.com. Okay. And then letters start rolling in. Right. I had my cousin who was a big Boise state fan. He's in Idaho. Sent my mom, the, the, um, the article, I sent her the, the website, the mm -hmm. rivals website. I was like, yo, it's like, you know, he's looking at the Boise state rivals.com. Right. Said, right yo, right. my cousin's on the front thing. And, then the process started, and uh, Oregon State was the first one to offer me. Uh, they verbally offered me as a sophomore, and then the word spread. And at some point, Pac, all the Pac-10 Pac at that point, but then Pac-12 offered me. I had some. I had LSU. I had Notre Dame. Um, when it was all said and done, I had like 20 offers. Okay. Yeah. And by the time senior year comes, we'll go back to the injury, right? Mm-hmm. You got all these offers on the table, <clears throat> mm -hmm. senior year. Yeah, and we we talk. I, I talk about this with other athletes sometimes. It's interesting seeing like these bowl games on TV, and the players are like, "I'm not gonna play in that because I'm about <laughs> to go to the league." Yeah, or like seniors in high school, like, "Yeah, I already got my scholarship. I'm good. I need mm -hmm. to stay safe, whatever it may be." Mm -hmm. So, what was your mindset kind of during that time? Whether I was gonna play or not. Yeah, like senior year of high yeah. school, you're like. 
if I was if I could strap on them pads, I was out there. You was out there. Yeah, yeah. for sure. I mean, because I'd I'd gone through injuries, right? Mm-hmm. So I knew what it was like to have the game stripped away from you, mm-hmm. you know, because it it had been for me, not by my choosing. Mm-hmm. And that shit sucked. You right. know, I found at an early age, like, yeah, that shit sucks. Like, one, this football shit is not guaranteed. It's not going to be around forever because, <clears throat> you know, I'm, what, 13, 14 years old, having a season-ending injury surgery. And so, I, you know, I just realized that. And so I really appreciate, appreciated being able to play, okay. being able to be out there, so. Never would have crossed my mind in high school or college to not play if I was able to. So or when professional. You, when you got hurt senior year, uh-huh. you had already accepted your offer. No, I hadn't. So what did the process look like there? Luckily, it didn't really change. Okay, there was only one school that pulled their offer. Okay, University of Oregon. Really, <laughs> haters. Oregon. They didn't pull their offer when I got hurt. It wasn't because I got hurt. It was because I decided not to take my visit. Uh, because I had junior year, starting junior year, I was going to Corvallis, I was going to Eugene, Oregon State in Oregon. I was going to going to the games, mm-hmm. hanging out because it was right up the street. Literally so I had right taken so many unofficials to Oregon and to Oregon State that when it came down to name my official visits, you know, they weren't going to be one of the five schools. Right. It's like, fuck that. I've already been there. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> like, I've been there several like, I times. I want to yeah. go somewhere else. Yeah. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I didn't want to stay in Oregon. I wanted to go get a different experience. Okay. And so I ended up taking, uh, funny enough, I took four of those visits to the California Pac-12 schools. Really? So UCLA, uh, USC, Cal, Stanford. And then I took my fifth one to Notre Dame. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, and Oregon was salty. Yeah. When I announced it, I they like had a call. I think if it was if it wasn't Chip, it was uh, Greatwood, the def- the offensive line coach who okay. was like our regional recruiter, and he was like, "So you gonna take your visit?" <laughs> I was like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> it's like, all right, we have uh, nothing more to talk about here. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you get hurt. That happens. Mm-hmm. Now, how do you decide where to go? This is like a decision that. You have to factor so many different elements to what can happen because of going yeah. to school. If I don't make it to the league, what is the you know repercussions of these things that I've yeah. chosen? Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I think uh, the education piece played a big role. Mm-hmm. Having had injuries, knowing that the football wasn't going to last forever played a big role. It humbled me. Mm-hmm. Um, those injuries and not being able to play humbled the hell out of me because – you know, when you're, especially when you're high school and you're the best player on your team, when you're one of the best players in the state, it's easy to kind of walk around with your, your chest puffed out and think that you're right. invincible right. until that ACL goes and it's over with. And then right. you're sitting on the, you know, you watching the, you watching the games. You're not that guy anymore, to your point from like the identity piece. And so when I was choosing a college, my parents and I had decided that you know, and I didn't even really have to talk to my parents about it. I knew that I wanted to go somewhere that was academically prestigious. Mm -hmm. And so that's why for me, it came down to Berkeley and it came down to Stanford. And, um, my parents was pushing Stanford. The whole family was pushing Stanford. Anyone who I told that those were like my final two, they were like, Oh, easy decision. Right. right, (laughs) right, right, right. (laughs) But, um, I loved what Berkeley and Cal was doing. I loved the the coaches who were recruiting me. That was Coach Gould, who was running back coach, uh, Tosh Lupoy, um, who's actually at U of O now, um, was a D line coach. And then Berkeley and Portland had these similarities. They're both pretty quirky cities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And at the time, I didn't know why it felt so much like home, but now it's like very clear, you know, very like liberal and. Uh, and just easy going individualistic cities. It felt like I could be myself there. And there was some uh, really, I think there was a strong culture. I saw guys like Cameron Jordan who had gone to the league and then mm-hmm. Cal was telling me that I'd come in and fill his slot, play that position. Uh, and I wanted to go to a public school, man. Mm-hmm. Y'all got to have all the fun in high school, you know, <laughs> you public school kids. Bruh. I'm in a private school, baby. Oh I was like, I don't want to go to Stanford. I don't want to do what my parents want me to do. This is my... My chance to, you know, call my own shot. So I'm to back. I feel it. Yeah. So, okay. During this time, I was uh, going to Foothill. I remember y'all played the Ducks. 
at the 49ers stadium. Yeah. But you were yeah. hurt. Yeah. Again. Yeah. And I'm like, bro, I feel like you get hurt every season. Seven in a row. It was literally every single season. But you were like making it through. And I don't know. I, the reason why I'm saying this is because people got to understand this. Like you was going through a lot. Yeah. Again, that's a huge mental battle every single season. Yeah. Can't play all the games. Can't do all these things. And then still make it to the league. Still do well in academics. Still, like you said, we haven't talked about it yet, but learning about investing, doing those things yeah. on the next level, like excelling in these things during a hard time and struggle during sports. So, mm. uh, yeah, I remember during that time, though, I don't remember which year that was for you. What year was that? Like our, I, I got to Cal year. in uh, 2011. I think it was 2013. <laughs> Team. Might have been your last year. You played there. at the 49ers stadium? Yeah. That was early then, because that was Candlestick. It was the new it was a new stadium. Oh, it was a new the one. new Niners it was stadium. Levi's? Mm-hmm. Oh, that'll have been later then. It was either 13 or 14. Yeah, it would have been later. Something like that. Yeah. Okay. So either way, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh you get to college. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, like we talked about, investing. Where did you yeah. learn? to jump on it sooner than later because we always talk about this and then people wait until they're 35 yeah they're right. like, oh if i was y'all like that, that. but mm-hmm. she was like no i'm jumping on it like i'm about yeah. to figure this out yeah i really didn't learn about investing it's crazy because i was I, I was in the business school i went to high school of business is one of the better business schools in the country it was the best school to like the best degree to pursue at cal and i learned about Investing, I guess, through like my financial classes and the, you know, whatever I was required to take, but it really didn't hit like it was something that I could do mm-hmm. right now. Uh, it wasn't until later when I did my graduate transfer to Stanford and I was studying in my master's program and I took a finance class and uh, around the same time. I talked to my boy Dimitri, who was at Santa Clara. He was a finance major, and he put me on to E-Trade. Mm-hmm. I was like, "What? what is E-Trade? E-Trade.com. He's like, yo, it's an app or it's a website. Like, look, I can buy my stock. I this can buy a stock. This before Robinhood and all the other yeah, stuff. Yeah, exactly. It yeah. wasn't even like it, it was tough to use. Like, mm-hmm. you had to you still use the URL maybe. Yeah, and, there wasn't even <clears throat> fractional shares like that, I don't think, at the time. Yeah. It uh, wasn't even a thing like that. It made it way easier now. <laughs> it's way easier. And I mean, the interface was like, it just, it looked like a traditional website. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Dimitri was like, yeah, you could, you could buy stock. I was like, damn, I didn't know you, I didn't know you could do that. I never had even really asked the question. Right. Uh, and he put me onto that. And this was the same time, like kind of around my finance class. And this is also around the time I was doing OTAs with the, uh, with the Texans. So it was all this kind of, culmination of getting a little bit of money learning about investing in class and then my homie put me on to the ability to actually do it and then i started uh starting investing in stocks and my first deep dive was into uh the virtual reality space okay and the reason that i did that was because my grandfather when he passed in 2014 which was the year that before I'd, I'd graduated, he passed in 2014. And then my parent or my mom and her siblings were like, you know, splitting up his, his, the inheritance and all this. And, mm-hmm. uh, he had stock in Starbucks, he has stock in Microsoft. Yeah. And he had invested in these companies when, you know, Starbucks, Starbucks was just the local coffee shop up right. in Seattle. Right, right, right. You know, my grandpa's from Idaho mm-hmm. grew up in Idaho. So he's investing in Microsoft, you know, like young Microsoft. We're right, talking young right. Bill Gates. Yeah, he got yeah, in yeah. early. And so I was like, I thought to myself, it was like this uh this this understanding that, well, my grandfather must have had some type of vision for what the future might look like. Mm-hmm. And so he invested in what he thinks the future will, will look like. Mm-hmm. And those are one of the two of the most, you know, successful investments that he had. So for me, I was like, Okay, let me put my place myself in 2015. What do I think the future will look like? Mm-hmm. And the answer to that question in my first deep dive of investing was virtual reality. Okay. And so I got deep into like the companies that were purchasing the goggles, which was Facebook at the time, Twitter, 
Um, I got deep into like the uh, the mechanics of the technology. Right. You know what goes, what allows them to like to AMD be to work. Stuff. Yeah. yeah, the semiconductors, mm-hmm. the chips. Yeah, you know the microprocessors. Right. Yeah, the graphics. Right. So I got Nvidia. The, Nvidia, Nvidia, Nvidia out of was my State too. Like, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's how I got into it. Okay, so before we get next part, <clears throat> talking about money, going to lead and everything, uh-huh. you got to go to school with your brother. Yeah. And at the same time, your sister was going to college playing nope. volleyball. Nope, she was still in high school. Still in high school? Yeah. Okay, so what was it like being like, yo, I get to transfer. Now I'm still able to go to Stanford. Yeah. What made you make that decision? <clears throat> and then I'm sure I, I'm sure brother had a huge factor in huge, it. Huge, huge. But- I wouldn't have did it without him. Yeah, how does that whole thing play out? Yeah, I wouldn't have did it without Cameron. So what happened was 2014 season, um, I'm a senior. It's my third year of eligibility um, because I had the red shirt because of a hand injury the year before that. So 2014 season, having a solid season, I'm thinking in my mind, after this season, I'm going to go to the league. Okay. I feel I was feeling like I was ready. Tear my ACL. 2014. The other side. The other leg? The other, the other ACL. So yes. now you got two so dirty I got knees. two. Yeah. <laughs> I got two. So, tear my ACL. The league is out of the picture. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stay for another year. I got one more year of eligibility. So, I'm going to do my graduate studies. And so, I started exploring what graduate studies would look like at Cal. Cal is a very, like, research-driven graduate programs so phds two-year programs this education program that was like available nothing that i was interested in right okay so i'm starting exploring at the same time my brother's a senior in high school balling balling going crazy won a state championship yeah how many touchdowns he had two, that year? two-time state champion crazy he would bro bro he was going stats, crazy <laughs> his stats are stupid. He's had like five touchdowns a game. Yeah, he bro, it was stupid. They dropped seventy points, I think, against Tiger, in like his stat line. I I I I need to bring it. I need to pull it up. It was nuts. So he was being recruited all over the place. He's trying to decide where he wants to go. Okay, Stanford's recruiting him hard. He's saying he's looking at Stanford and he hits me. It's like, hey, uh, Coach Shaw, at the, who, the, who was the head coach of Stanford at the time recruit my brother hard it's like coach shaw told me <clears throat> that uh your recruiting process isn't over because if you remember mm-hmm. when i was in mm-hmm. high school coming out right it was cal and stanford so your recruiting process isn't over and i'm thinking of my sister, I'm like oh whatever man you talking shit and i was like uh why would i go to stanford you know i'm a captain at cal you know at, at berkeley and we're texting my brother and i texting back and forth I said why would i go to stanford he said to go get the best master's degree in the world. Mm. <laughs> Hard to pass on that one. <laughs> I said, all right, little brother. <laughs> you making some sense. So I looked into it, and I looked into the, uh There was a degree that I was able to go get uh, in one year and then go to the league. And uh, so we had to go through all these, these hoops because this is before the transfer portal, but ended up applying to school. Couldn't leave Cal until I got into school, so went through a whole bunch of drama there. End up getting into the management science and engineering program and uh, told Cal I was going to leave. Showed up to freshman orientation with the football team with my brother. Today's partner is Sneaker Throne. They have multiple options when it comes to durable and high quality display cases. One of my personal favorites is the drop side display case. I'm a size 13 and I can easily fit my shoes inside of here and I have hundreds of these stacked throughout my rooms to display my sneakers. When it comes to the cases in particular, you have four different color options, clear, black, white, and red. So if you're looking at grabbing one of these for yourself or for someone else, make sure you guys check out sneakerthrone.com and don't forget to use the discount code DNA show at checkout for 10% 10% off for all your orders. All right, let's get back to this podcast. Starting all over again in some sense, but you like, you know, you got experience in the game and everything. Yeah. Um, and honestly, that's not too far away from where you was at before. No, nah, it was a quick drive. Yeah. It was an hour down. Yeah, down it's not south. bad. So yeah. you're not, it's not like you're moving across the country or anything nope. like that. You still similar, you know, area. Yeah. Still kicking it with my Berkeley homies when mm-hmm. I, you know, when I could get up there. It was cool. So, so you go to Stanford and uh what's this process because oh yeah you guys went to the rose bowl yeah you had a squad chris mccaffrey was coming out the same year yeah yeah i so, think it was mccaffrey was I'm not, I'm not, you guys had some it was mccaffrey hogan 
uh, Austin Hooper was playing tight end. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, That's right. Josh Garnett, who was drafted in the first round, was their guard. Kyle Murphy played in the league. He played tackle. We had uh, on the D-line, it was me, Aziz Shatu, Solomon Thomas, Harrison Phillips. All guys played in the league. Uh, Blake Martinez was playing middle linebacker. Uh, Justin Reed was young, but he's playing safety. Mm-hmm. Bryce Love was playing running back. We had a we were nasty. You guys had a squad because I we remember you guys. Nasty. You guys used to give Oregon hell, and I used to hate it. Yeah, <laughs> they beat us that year though. Was okay, trash. <laughs> so, uh, how how'd the whole season go? Like for you, it was good. It was the first year I stayed healthy. That's good. Yeah, it was the first year that I stayed healthy since my sophomore year in high school. So you just I'd had a so- I had a season and an injury seven years straight up until I got to Stanford. And it was just like the stars is aligning now. It was perfect. And I, I went in there, and, and it wasn't by happenstance. It was in t- the way I trained, the way I was being trained. Uh, it was an intentional approach to performance. We were highly focused on mobility, the training staff, the strength conditioning coach, Coach Turley, uh, wouldn't allow me to to put on any any heavy weights on my back, right. uh, lift any heavy weights until I could do the movements properly. Mm-hmm. I did physical therapy every day. You know, they they eased me into training camp until I was ready to ready to go. And so I attribute really my ability to go and play professionally to that organization that um, that program because without them I would have I probably would have gotten hurt again because it you know after you have one injury like they snowball right when I think about high school bro when I came off my first knee injury they said it's a six month recovery my I'm playing basketball as soon as six months it <laughs> and I'm stopping PT <laughs> and I did physical therapy two days a week right like bro when I'm getting back on the basketball court like my body's just adapting to move how it needs to move mm-hmm. so. I may have a little gimp and here. I may have a little strength sport, off, and yeah. then that leads to the next one. Mm-hmm. Then you do the same thing, which then leads to the next one. So, you know, being at Stanford, they did a good job of resetting and kind of cleaning the slate. And I uh, made it through the whole season and, and played well. Uh, I missed one game, Oregon State game, had a little scare, but uh, played well throughout the whole year and won a Pac-12 championship against SC and won the Rose Bowl against Iowa. Fire. Yeah. Okay. You got the ring still? Yeah. Got the ring. Was it pinky ring or what? I think it's my middle. Middle finger? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to ask my mom where it's at. I had to put it in her in her custody. I didn't want to lose it. She got it somewhere. <laughs> I feel that. Okay, so um getting ready for the league. You training. Uh were you done with classes and everything right after the season, or did you still have to worry about school during no, the whole had, process? I had school. So that I trained at, on campus. Okay. A lot of guys leave and they go train in Texas or Florida or down in LA at one right. of the like training programs. But me and a group of guys stayed on on campus and we trained together. Trained with Coach Terry and I continued to take classes. Okay. Yeah. Um. And then the draft process. Mm-hmm. What did? Because you went to the combine. No. You didn't go to the combine. No invite to a combine. No invite to the All Star games. That's right. Okay. No, no okay. visits. So, <clears throat> what's it like? Thinking about that process, like, all right, bro, I'm about to go to the league. You talk to teams, though. Yeah, some teams will call me. You talk to some teams. Teams that call. Okay. So, what were the teams that had talked to you? Uh, I remember Minnesota calling. Houston called. Pittsburgh maybe called. Uh, Detroit. Coast Steelers. Called. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was just a few kind of sprinkled through, like, leading needed. leading up to – uh, the draft like that little glimmer of hope like okay yeah this is worthwhile it's worth me training worth me doing these things oh for sure okay yeah so you're going through that process don't go to the combine you're still like all right i got my combine at my or my pro, my day, pro day yeah uh, at school yeah how'd that go went crazy went crazy went crazy yes sir yeah it felt great i was i was running running fast i'm waiting at 269 uh Perfect which is weight. like yeah because because for me it could have gone either way i could have been i played at stanford at D line, mm-hmm. played a four technique, three tech, one tech, goes all in the trenches. Mm-hmm. But I really was built more for as an outside linebacker, mm-hmm. and so I wanted to be in a weight 
class that allowed me to kind of be able to do both right. or that a team would be able to see me do both. So if I needed to balloon up and be 280 and play that, then I could play in the, in the trenches or if I needed to come down to 260, 255, which is what I wanted to do. Right. And now I was positioning myself and I could do that. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the draft happens. Did you think you were going to get drafted late or did you just like, I know I'm going to be a free agent? I had a, I had a little bit of hope. <laughs> I had a little bit of hope. Yeah. Okay. So you're like, I'm watching, watching this shit like, ah, uh, you know, this ain't my round, but, <laughs> <laughs> but turn it up a little bit. Houston's about to it's go. It's the last day. <laughs> yeah. It got to the point though. I was sick of that shit, man. I was just watching and just was making me, it was frustrating me just watching people go. And so I just went outside and played basketball with my brother. That's how right. I finished off the draft. Right. Like, I'm better than him. Yeah, it's like, fuck <laughs> this, man. Okay, so the draft happens. You're kind of like sick. How long does it take till you get the call? Uh, Right after. Like immediately? Yeah, yeah, right okay. after. I had a call from Pittsburgh and Houston. Okay. There were the two teams that call. <laughs> and uh, the call with Pittsburgh was funny. Like, I talked to uh, Joey Porter. Okay. He was a linebacker coach. Talked to okay. Joey Porter. He called me. He's like, hey, how you doing? You know, we want to bring you in. And you know, we like what you can do. You know, this, that, and third. <clears throat> I was like, okay, cool. You know, love love the Steelers. You you think I got a chance to make the team? Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah. You know, well, if it was me, you know, we got this guy on the team. He's 38 years old. If it was me, I'll come in and I'll beat him out. I'm like, you talking about James Harrison? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, like, he didn't even name John. He's like, got this 38-year-old. You know, I'll come and beat him out if I was you. It's like, bro, you talking about the Hall of Famer? Right. Like, it's like a legendary stealer. <laughs> I'm going to come take his spot? Okay. And uh, they ended up <clears throat> uh, removing the, the offer off the table anyways. And then it was, it was Houston. And they had been the hottest on me throughout the whole process. And... So you're like, um, I got one shot. I got one shot, yeah. Mike Vrabel was, had a uh, quote unquote, like, he was the one talking to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then we lied. I was like, yeah, shit, I'm coming to Houston. Let's do it. So uh, what, that, what was that like, first getting out there? It was cool. It was cool. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was funny. It was because it was, uh, it was stressful a little bit when they, uh, when they first gave me that offer after the draft to come in. Because they told me that I was, they were gonna have to put injury waivers on my knees mm. because I've been hurt so much. Okay. So an injury waiver is basically means like if you come in and you get hurt, they don't gotta pay you. Mm -hmm. Like you're just cut. Right. You know. So if you come in, you end up having to get a surgery. Like, and I don't know if the workers' comp shit, but like, you basically not getting paid and you a gimp. You know. And so okay. I was like, damn, that sucks. And I called my coach. And I was like unsure. I called my my Stanford coach, and he was like. Cause I was I was considering not doing it, mm. slightly considering not doing it, and I called him just to see what he thought, and he was like, "Man, if I had the chance to chase my dream, I don't care what they would what they say, right, right. I'm doing it." Right. I was like, "All right, that's all I need to hear." Did you? So, what was your backup plan if you didn't make it? Graduate from Stanford and go work in the tech world and do a startup. Find something to do. Yeah, stay in the bag probably. Yeah, I'd been working on a startup up, up till that point, and that probably wouldn't have been my my path. Otherwise, it would have been a straight okay. entrepreneurship. Okay. Yeah. Do you think you see yourself doing something like that maybe like five, ten years from now? Yeah, right now. Yeah. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. Right now. I am doing it. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. We'll talk about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so, workout goes great. Um, You're on the team. You make yeah. it through all the cuts. Yeah. You play the season. Mm -hmm. But you had – who was uh, starting – Yo, rookie year. That was in my room. It was. Oh my, uh, I figured like there was a couple of good guys. It was Clowny, Clowny, Whitney Merciless, yeah, uh, John Simon. Um, I mean, obviously JJ Watt was he was in the D line room, but he played the edge. Uh, Brian Cushing was in the linebacker room. That's right. Yeah, we had boys. We had boys. It was a good team. What do you think? Uh, they taught you that you kind of passed down when you became mm -hmm. a vet. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, the uh, I always tell my young bulls when I'm in a locker room the JJ story because for me, I'm an underdog, right? I was mm -hmm. undrafted, you know, mud boy, like I had no shot. So for me, it was always I got to be that much better than the next guy, 
every practice, every rep, like I'm going hard. Mm-hmm. Like I'm the guy that dudes are like, come on, B, like slow Chill down. Out. Yeah, it's yeah. a walk through. Slow like, down. Nah, you, ain't bro. Got, you don't got to put your hands on me like that. Right. Like, but um, watching JJ Watt practice, uh, there was one time after after a practice, I asked him about a move that he was doing. He was like, yeah, you know, taught me, kind of show, showed it to me. He got this, like, uh, this signature move that he'd always do. It was kind of like a side side swipe, dip, rip, and that shit would get home mm-hmm. so frequently, especially in practice. It got home a lot in games, but in practice, it shit would get home all the time. And I asked him, I was like, you know how you do it? And he showed me, and he was like, he was like yeah, man, that's why uh, I go so hard and walk through. It's because I can visualize myself making the play. Mm-hmm. Every time I do it and walk through, the guy across from me, he's obviously going slower, but I'm getting to the quarterback. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be able to visualize that and feel it. So then once it happens in the game, it's not a surprise. Right. And so then I kind of always pass that on, along to, to younger dudes, especially if I see a younger guy like going through the motions. It's like, hey, man, don't do that. You right. got to be out there and, one, visualize it for yourself, but also show show the coaches that you the guy for the job. Mm-hmm. Don't give them no reason to let you to think that you're not the right person. Right. Win every time. Right. And I feel like that applies to not only football, but literally uh, every aspect of the workforce or you yeah. name it of life. Yeah. Um, in that, because you know us as athletes, we always can apply those same fundamentals or tactics or whatever you want to call Facts. it to Facts. other elements of our lives. Yeah. Um, and different things. So I think people that yeah, y- you may not have wins in the NFL or whatever it is, but you can definitely take these things and still use those as you know words of advice uh, for yourself in your day to day or whatever it may be. Even if it comes down to cleaning dishes, like <laughs> you know what I'm saying, like you could do it better and you can do yeah. the little things and all the different stuff. Um. So I was going to ask you something about. Well, just a piggyback on that. Go ahead. I feel like uh, it's always this competition uh, with yourself to be the best that you can possibly be. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, you know, when you're leaving shit on the table. Right. You know what I mean? Like when you half ass and you know it more than anybody else Mm -hmm. knows it. And like at the end of the day, it really is not hurting anybody but you. Right. Influencing like what you want to do at the end of the day. And when you set a goal and like you 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 envision what you want to be, like I was saying earlier, what, how, what my parents taught me is like, it's cool to want that. Right. And to see that thing and like, yeah, I like have a passion, like I want to go get that. But understanding like what it takes to be that, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, if, uh, if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you know, that's making hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue on a monthly basis or whatever you want to be. Right. Like if you're not waking up early in the morning and getting to it, you ain't doing what it takes. Right. You know what I mean? Because right. there's somebody else that's out there that that is doing those things and whatever that, you know, looks like. If you want to be the best mother or the best father and you're not taking your kids, you know, teaching your kids lessons, what, whatever, then it's like, are you doing what it takes? It's, it's nice to want that. It's mm-hmm. like 15%. 10% of the battle maybe. Right. But are you willing to do what it takes to become that? For sure. So during this time, I think that's what I was going to ask you. During this time, uh you started the foundation when? 2018. So that was deeper into your career. Yeah, that was after year 3. Okay. So that started with initially with the books. Yep. Okay. So talk about that. I volunteer with the Barbara Bush Foundation in Houston. And she was the she was the first lady with George Bush Senior, uh, and she was big into literacy and education. The Bush family's from Houston. And volunteered with them a few times. I went to some book fairs, and I really liked what they were doing. Reading played a really like huge part of my life from an educational standpoint. I used to read those Harry Potter books religiligiously. Oh man, oh, I was all about my it. My wife bro. loves that. Shit. I, was I do not all like about it, bro. It, bro. Oh, you tripping? Okay, okay, okay. Hold you on, ain't tried. On, you ain't on. tried. I never read the books. I read the first chapter of the first book, and I retired after that. I watched the movies. Well, why don't you like it? As then? of like a few years ago, I started watching the movies, and I was like, okay, I understand why people like them. Movies don't even do it justice. Bro. But I know the books they don't the books even do books. it justice. Bro. But you know, I'm kind of the opposite. Harry Potter, Ron Weasley, <laughs> Hermione. <laughs> Come on, man. <laughs> I'm so dead. You sleep. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. No, I don't know, bro. It's just I, I'm more of like a Marvel, you know. Oh, you're a Marvel guy. Yeah, like one of those. I feel that. Guys, yeah, yeah, you know? I feel that. I like was big kind of... sci-fi. I was like dragons and wizards. And yeah, shit. I didn't really like like Star Wars <laughs> and all that stuff. Like, yeah, I didn't get really that. You know, Star Wars. I think yeah, the closest I was. Lord of the to. Rings. Nah, I was a big Lord of the Rings. I didn't me. read the books. Really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was a nerd, bro. I still am I'm a geek. I'm like the because I grew up on like Pokemon and all that stuff. Because remember, I went to Japanese school and everything. So for me, it was like Japanese culture and all that stuff. So anime. Yeah, anime. Yu Gi Oh. All that stuff. I got all the cards. Did like, you see some of the cards up there? Like I got all the yeah. I had all that stuff. Still got the original stuff from back then when we was kids. Because I used to do research studies in Japan and all the different things. Oh, shit. So I was kind of like immersed in that world. You always been a cool kid, though, bro. Chill. You always been a cool kid, man. You always had the coolest sneakers. (laughs) You was always fucking selling shoes and you had flight school and you had all this stuff. I was just uh, trying to make it, bro. And your name is DJ, bro. That's the cool ass name. <laughs> That's a cool ass name, bro. <laughs> like you went to Grant. You hella cool, bro. <laughs> the rest of us is at private school reading Harry Potter. You slanging sneakers. You slanging Jordans. You're 12 years old. Oh, selling shoot. Jordans on your own website. Bruh, that is... <laughs> Don't listen to this man. <laughs> this guy's cool, man. He's let's cool. Let's get back on topic. Let's get all back right, on all topic. Right, all right, let's get back to it. <laughs> oh shoot. Um. So you started the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. And <clears throat> how? Uh, how have you been able to get to where you want to be from then to now? Yeah. Would you say, or do you think like there's some things you've learned over the years that yeah can help you take it farther, faster over the next X amount of years? Yeah. So, I mean, when I saw what Barbara Bush did, I was like, this was also around the same time where I was realizing the effects of gentrification Mm -hmm. on our communities, especially North and Northeast Portland, and how to displace a lot of our diverse communities, especially our black and brown communities. And for me, it was like, man, if we can't, if our people can't call a place home in this world that changes and shifts so often, but and we can't have a constant in home in our neighborhood and our community. Then it's like, damn, that sucks. Mm-hmm. It's like, what can I do to to help out and to give back? And I was peeling off the layers of that whole thing, and it was education, creativity, and physical wellness. And mm-hmm. it was like, if I can help to equip our neighborhoods and communities with those things, then you know, I'm taking a stab at fixing the problem. And so then I saw what Barbara Bush did with the with the book fairs, and I was like, you know what? This is a cool way to inspire a love of reading, which then, you know, can help encourage critical thinking and communication and literacy. So then the success levels and career outcomes of these neighborhoods will increase when then they'll, then they'll be able to mm-hmm. buy their homes, mm-hmm. you know, and stay put and mm-hmm. empower our community. So that was, that was the thought process. And it's been, you know, it's been a slow, it's been a slow ish. It's been a slow grind. You know, it's a, it's a, family run foundation that leans heavy on volunteers and people in the community to give their time and you know any uh any money that they're willing to to donate and then it's uh it's taking the time to do the work in a thoughtful way and being present in the community in the way that our community needs us so we've you know we've shifted and changed form a few different times and we continue to do that because the landscape changes here here in portland so We'll uh, we'll continue to grow and and deepen and widen our impact. And I'm uh so excited, you know. Whenever I'm in town, I always try to pull up whenever I can. Yeah. Uh, the, it's funny actually, funny because I missed last year, and that was the year we finally win a dodgeball tournament. <laughs> <laughs> That's the year Big Yard Bandits won the dodgeball tournament. That's what I'm tournament. saying. So yeah. I've been on his, oh yeah, because I've been you, on his yeah, squad. That's right. Yeah, you missed it, man. So, how many years has the dodgeball tournament been going? That was our first. That was our first event. That was like our first fundraiser. Uh, that was 2018. So okay, we missed one year because of COVID. So right. we've had. I think it was our fourth one that we just had. So yeah, he does like a dodgeball tournament in the summertime. This is like late summer. Uh, yeah, late late summer. This yeah. is in July. Late summer. Yeah. Uh, dodgeball tournament. Everybody gets together. All the homies. All, everybody. You see high school kids coming together, putting a squad <sighs> together. All the people, boys, girls, you and name it. Everybody's doing dogs, it. Too. And we just have a day and we have fun. Yeah. We raise money. And uh, it's dope 
seeing those type of things like in our city and you putting those things together and even like the marches and all the other stuff yeah. that's happened and getting the community together yeah. uh, is a huge thing. Something that's like bigger than football because you're impacting our people around sure. us at the same time too. So I definitely got to give you all flowers for those type of things and congratulate sure, you for that because it's not easy for people to get that many people together for anything. Mm -hmm. It's not as easy as it looks. Yeah. And uh, you guys do it and you do it well. Thank so, you, bro. Uh, definitely want to say that. And then obviously, yeah, I'm partially a part of the squad, but I lost the year. The year that they won was the year that I wasn't there. So maybe you're, I was the problem. You're an honor, you're an honorary champion, man. You're honorary maybe I champion. was the problem. I don't know. Once a big yard bandit, always a big yard bandit. So if you guys, yeah, if you guys want to pull up to the tournament next summer, let us know so we can get you guys. We need to do a bowling tournament, bro. We should. I want to I'm not bowling. a big bowler. Are you nice? That's my chance to get you. <laughs> <laughs> Are you nice? I'm solid. You could go. I'm all right. What's your average score? I don't know. What you what you shoot? I'm solid. One seven. I got my own ball. Oh yeah. That's enough to say, huh? That's enough. Yeah, that's enough. You yeah, you were consistent. What you hit two hundred? Oh yeah. Easy, bro. I've thrown seventeen strikes in a row before. What? Yes. Oh, you're nasty. I'm not that good. I got to practice to get back to that level. But yeah. I, I used to bowl uh, for the team in high school, actually, too. All so right. I was on the high school I take, team. I take you being a cool kid back. Yeah. <laughs> I take that back. Yeah. Man. You on the bowling team? Take me man. off the throne, please. <laughs> Stop it. I was on the bowling team. I was on the chess team. I went to state two years in a row in chess. For real? Yeah, I was on the bowling team. Went to state two years in a row. Bowled anchor for the uh, chess team. And then I did everything that we also did, you know, football, basketball, baseball, track. All you said you went stuff. anchor for the chess team. Yeah, had relays. Well, it's like they you use like your power players in different rounds, and then you can have it's like also you run anchor is like the last person to bowl like in the tenth frame for like in bowling. Oh, okay. where like you know how you could throw like three strikes in a row and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of like you just the same like thing the with captain chess or whatever you want to call it. Same thing with chess. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. That's so it'd be like those type of scenarios. Okay. But yeah, I, I was always into all that stuff too. He was a nerd, he was a nerd too. Huh? He was a nerd too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just went to Grant. So you know, I was a little yeah. bit better. <laughs> yeah. Baby. yeah, you on the, the cooler side of the nerd spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh that's all going great. Now tell me about the first property. What year were you in your career when you got your first property? Because I remember uh Man, what year was that? You had got a couple of properties the same year. Was that the same year? No, nah, so when you first started my rookie year. Uh, somebody suggested to me that I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Okay, so I read that book. Sure, everybody my rookie that year, now. and it was uh, it changed the way that I thought about about money, about finances. <clears throat> I would say that book was more flu influential through that those what the season was probably four months through those four months of me reading it then four years in a business in business school crazy yeah and uh after i got through that through that book i had the goal i said all right i want to be financially free <clears throat> with or without football i want to be financially free so after every season i want to buy a property okay and so I, I told my mom you know my mom holds me down on everything that i'm doing big yard properties managing all she does it all so i told her what i wanted to do and her and my realtor uh and also a really good friend maria elmore uh they started going around to properties at that mm -hmm. time and uh they were sending me links and i was looking on zillow and what and, type and Redfin, of property were you looking for single family okay single family i just wanted i wanted a crib and i wanted to rent it out i wanted it to be simple I put together an Excel spreadsheet, you know, make sure all my margins were cool, whatever. Mm -hmm. And we found one out in uh, Northeast Portland in the um, Glendevere area. And uh, they gave me a little FaceTime tour, walked through it. And I was like, okay, cool. Feel good about it. Put offer in. Okay. Scariest time of my life. I man. was about to say, how'd you feel? Because, I mean, like, obviously you got a different type of influx of money coming in. Compared to yeah, it didn't matter though because I was on, I was on a rookie deal, undrafted rookie deal with what was that uh, league with, injury, with injury waivers on my knees. Okay, and the league minimum when I got in was four hundred fifty thousand. Okay, what's it so now? After taxes, you know, I'm coming away with two hundred fifty maybe. Okay, what's it now? Five something? Five fifty? 
uh for rookies i think it's maybe up to like seven really 20 or something damn it went up a lot <laughs> Yes, I, it was good. going up every year by like ninety thousand or something. Like Luckily, that. you were in Texas, uh, Texas though, for taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was blessed being in Houston for sure. Okay, so you're like got a couple hundred bands, about to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Uh, definitely got into the first property. Yeah. Were you able to successfully get one every year after that, or how did it go? Yep. Okay. Every year, but then there was one year uh, that I had a commercial property that then I'd uh, I did a renovation on it, and the renovation. <clears throat> went from the property being one a single tenant to then I moved the staircase around and added a, another entrance so it became a dual tenancy. Okay. So in my mind I basically bought another unit through that right, right, renovation. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. And what do you look like now? Is it still like the same thing one a year? Is it like complex? Is it slow like down. Switching it's things up. Like now, yeah. Getting a little comfortable. Like what do you think? Um sorry to interrupt the podcast, but I had a quick question. Are you guys interested in taking your shoe game to another level, but you just don't know where to start? I built a full program just for somebody like you. The six figure sneaker head. It's an eight week program that takes you through all the steps that you need to know. We have a full community where you can engage with everybody else that's going through the same program as you. We have monthly live meetups where you can can connect with me and other members on the inside and we set goals for each other and held each other accountable also we give away a free pair of shoes every single month with different challenges if this is something that's for you or you're looking to take your game to the next level or even flip your sneakers to turn that into real estate this is the place where you need to be i can help you with finding loans and remodeling properties and getting yourself on the right path to become a millionaire if that's something that you desire if this sounds like something for you hit the link down below in the description and get signed up today this is more than just sneakers i want to see people grow and succeed in all aspects of life let's get back to the podcast i'm renovating now like in the process of turning over some of these uh the older units that i uh that i have and and starting to build up equity okay in the properties you know i got good really good interest rates and and loans for right now some of them are actually adjustable so it'll probably be coming up what they will be coming up here in the next four or five years so um just kind of staying put right now. I'm still keeping my eyes open for deals. Mm-hmm. Um, but at some point, we'll probably start to leverage some of the equity in these properties. So then I don't have to come out of uh, out of pocket out, no out more. Out of, po- out of pocket with cash, especially being a free agent right now. I'm, I'm an employee, man. I can't mm-hmm. just be throwing bread around like that. I feel that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Tell me about that mindset of and how you navigate. Essentially... Because they switched the contracts where you could get paid throughout the whole year compared to every week after the game. Isn't that yeah. a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They spread it throughout so the whole year. So you could switch it. You could choose whichever one you want. Which was good for the league. No, you can't choose. Oh, that's how it is for Yeah, everybody. that's how it is for everybody. Oh, okay. I thought it was like you this or that. Which they did that because like what it used to be, it was they were, they'd pay you just in the season. Mm-hmm. So your last check would be in February. Or January, whenever the your your season stopped, and then you wouldn't see another check until OTAs right. the following year. So, I mean, it was good for some of us who would take that money and invest it into something or have it right. gain an interest. For others, it was bad. For the other guys who are blowing their bread, mm-hmm. you know, and out at the club or buying jewelry or spending frivolously, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't good for them because. By the time OTAs run around, uh, roll around, they actually need those checks. So it was really to protect uh, the all of the players as the a whole. The league as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. It was a good move, but it sucked to like not be able to have that uh those checks and be able to put it into, you know, uh an interest bearing savings account. Right. Yeah, lost out on a couple hundred, maybe a couple thousand bucks. But right, 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 right. Okay, so um, yeah, what was your mindset behind kind of navigating? I guess essentially a new monthly cash flow. Um, I mean, it was fine. It was it was fine. It didn't change anything really for for me because like you know, I was it was fortunate that it was they were handsome checks regardless of mm-hmm. what structure it was, mm-hmm. and I probably also did appreciate it having checks coming in. You know, in the March, April, and May 
still having money coming in. What was hard was over those those four months to just see the account just dwindle down. Mm -hmm. Right. And those are the months that you're in your off season, you're trying to travel, you know, you might do a little online shopping. Mm -hmm. I think it's where most of the spending is probably happening. Mm -hmm. And you get no checks come in. So you're just seeing their account just dwindle down. And so by the time May rolls around and you are getting money back, you're like, ah, finally. Right. I feel that. Yeah. Uh, what was one of your crazy purchases that you're like, whew, I did that. So we had this thing, we had this tradition. It's funny because I just said I spent money, only spent money in the offseason. That's a lie. It's a damn <laughs> lie. <laughs> we had this thing uh, before every game when we were in Houston, before every home game. Me oh, and, yeah. Me and my boy, uh, Will Fuller, who played receiver for us, was my guy. Uh, we would go to the Galleria. So we stayed at the team hotel, which was right across the street from the Houston Galleria. Mm -hmm. We'd go to the Galleria, and we had to make one purchase. And we would like kind of had this thing that was like, depending on what you buy, could influence how you play. You know, so, so if you make a big purchase and you ball, it's like shit. Next week you got to make a big purchase, bro. Right, right, you right. know, I, I I used to call Will uh, Junior. Say Junior, you went for you know you went for one hundred fifty last week. You got to get a you know get get another another big purchase. <laughs> One of my purchases in the gallery before a game, I bought this. Uh, Louis Vuitton denim jacket. I was about to say, it was I that still, jacket? I, I still that. flex to this day, and it was a it was a few racks. I don't know if I don't know if I balled or not. <laughs> <laughs> One special teams tackle. <laughs> yeah, I didn't do that again. That's funny. Yeah, for me, so same thing. <clears throat> while I was talking about the cash flow and all this stuff. Social media, bro. This stuff is like all over the place. You have one video pop, like. You making twenty thousand dollars mm. off a of video, doing some yeah, crazy stuff, right, right? right? Next month it could be like right back down. Who yeah. knows, right? So like, it's like there's a consistency, but at the same time there's like these crazy spikes in there. Yeah, and it's like you never know when they're gonna come. But some of your some of your videos are timeless, though, right? You got exactly. you got a lot of evergreen content. Exactly, and that's what I focus on is like building content that is like having a rental property yeah. or whatever. Like I know it's gonna keep making money. Yeah. off of the videos that make sense. Uh. Because a lot of creators may chase the virality or the right now things, but then it's like nobody cares about it next week or two months mm -hmm. from now. Yeah. So they're just like living and dying by the content yeah. and they can't take a break from it because they're relying on posting yeah. that next video, posting that next video, going, yeah. going. And they're just in the hamster wheel, just running. Who trying to the create. coldest, the coldest at, at the evergreen content? Wait, say it again. Who's the coldest at evergreen content? Who's the coldest at evergreen content? You know, I really like Think Media. Think Media? Think Media. Huh. They teach people about how to be better creators on the internet. Oh, really? And um, <clears throat> I don't know if they're the GOAT, but for me, I got a lot of my foundation from them. I learned mm. a lot from them personally. Uh, and then I originally learned it from their channel, and then I met them, and I learned even more, you know, deeper knowledge. Okay. Um, But they're, they're the basics of, like, you know, these mics, these these arms, these cameras, these tripods, these lights, like they'll break them down and be like, this is how they work. This is how you use it. Da, da, right. da. Like giving you the ins and outs of it, right. compare it to another mm -hmm. thing. And then now it's like when you're on the market to purchase that product or learn more about it, they always have that video on the internet. Mm. And these things still stay relevant for so many years. That's like real. a lot of these mics and stuff or you name it, a lot of these different tech products do actually stay relevant in the game like i've had my cameras for four years or something like that yeah so <clears throat> I people love can go arms. back and look those uh look those videos up and they continue yeah. to get views year over year and they show it through Stop. their content as well i love that so yeah i don't know i learned a lot uh from it through that but then yeah some of my crazy purchases you know just be the shoes like yeah. that'd be my big thing but i always justify it like why well, you got three of the same deal. shoes right here which one? Oh, the kobe's? the kobe's why you got three of them so they're actually the same, but different. But they're the same, same, but different. <laughs> the, for, the top two are samples, so they're different. Okay. You can see the differences like between the greens. Like you see that one's darker and that one's lighter on the yeah. back end, on the patent leather area. Yeah. And then the pattern of the the shade that they put on top of the shoe mm -hmm. uh, is different. So this is when they were first sampling it. They ran different runs, and then yeah. they get to the final product, and then they make that version. Okay. So I had got lucky to, uh, I was, you know, gifted some of the product. And I got to debut the shoe 
uh, to the internet, letting everybody know, hey, this shoe is going to be coming out. So when oh, the Grinch is retro, uh, I was the first person to like put it out on the internet. And uh, I got the three different versions of the samples Damn. and stuff. So for me, it's just like something dope to have. Obviously, they're worth a lot of money and everything, but... You was the only creator that they sent the shoes to? Right. So it oh, was just like a dope, a dope opportunity. <clears throat> and uh, I, yeah, never plan to sell them or anything. I think it's just a dope story. It's so yeah. cool to have in the collection. How many How many uh, you wear? What, what's all in the rotation? Man, I wear a lot of stuff. It's just... Uh, I, cl- I got to clean it and make it look pretty again for the cases. Yeah, I don't like right. it to look burnt out, you know? Yeah. So, like, if you look down here, all this stuff is, like, in my rotation right now. Just, like, what I be wearing. What you'll see is, like, a lot of classics. Oh, I got you. Breads and cements and, you yeah. know, concords and all mm-hmm. this stuff. Like, uh, those are always heavy in the rotation, like, in my day-to-day life. But these are, like, events or whatever's right. going on. So, right. And I got, you know, five, 600 pairs of shoes. So, it's, like, it takes time to get through everything. <sighs> but... These are have, all full, all these boxes? Those are actually empty. All my ones are on display in a different room. So <laughs> I just leave some of the boxes in here Yeah. to kind of like go with the aesthetic. But that's like, yeah, a whole nother thing. I'm going to need your uh, affiliate code for these boxes because I want, I want some. How many shoes you got? Maybe we could do a closet makeover video. We should. In my crib, I probably got uh, 25. Oh, yeah. The house. I got a bunch of stuff in Miami still in storage. For real? Yeah. Did you did you come a crib out there? there? No, nah, I didn't. But I left all my stuff out there because I want to. So it's like a. It's, He's like it's the it's the one it's string the pulling me back. Yeah. Like, I still got stuff <laughs> yeah. out there. So I might it's as well the two hundred dollars a month pulling me back to get a crib out there. It's just a reminder every time I see it in my account. I feel that. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah, you know, I do the room makeover videos and everything. So I think it'd be dope. We, we should do, do it. Collection. Yeah. Send me some pictures and I'll uh I'll map it out. Okay. Get the containers figured out and everything. Yeah. Bet. I love doing those videos. Really? They do really well. Um, okay. Off we're getting off topic. Um We love a tangent. Yeah, we went off on our little, we tangent. Like a little tangent. Um <clears throat> so you're you're deeper into the league now. Yeah. You got the properties figured out. You're still investing in the stocks and everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now you got even more uh, wh- that's the other thing. People can get like an ETF mm-hmm. or they can just like individually pick the stocks that they like. Yeah. And what's your route? I was always an individual picker. Okay. I like But this that is too. how I had it though. This is, I, I have, <clears throat> I chose different platforms for different reasons. Okay. So like I started with my E-Trade. In my mind, those were just like my grandfather. Those were lifetime holds. These are my OGs right These here. These are my right, OGs. Right. These are ones that I'm going to buy and I'm going to hold on to my whole life. And these are the ones that I've done research on. I've looked through the 10Ks. I've understood which chips are going into which VR, mm-hmm. this and that, you know. So that was my E-Trade. Then <clears throat> I got this app called Stash. Okay. Stash was like, for me. I use that for a little bit. It was my little black box. Okay. You know, it was like the the shoe box under the bed with the money that's like, that's just your secret stash. Okay. So that's what you stash for. And they had this Park My Cash ETF that gave a good little dividend. So I was like, okay, put some money there. And how then, did you, hold on, before that, how did you decide on like how much to put in there? Because you know how like I tell people like, man, if you can at least do like $100 a month or whatever, yeah. like just to get started, right? Yeah. Like, how did you decide like what your number was that's like, I'm comfortable with this? Um, was it monthly? Was it like it wasn't? It, it wasn't. Like- it wasn't scientific, but it was like I had weekly. Um, what do you call it? Recurring investments yeah. into uh, into the stash one, and then essentially, like I would just when I was doing the research, and I found myself with some time to go through the be the Wall Street Journal or go through articles, and I wanted to buy stocks, and I just do that with that on E Trade. Okay. It wasn't a it wasn't a science to it. Okay. It wasn't like a certain percentage of my income or whatever, because like you know I was looking enough to be, I was I had enough cash to do whatever I, I wanted, mm-hmm. and okay. so a lot of it was going into there, and then uh, and I had Wealthfront for a little bit, which then it was kind of a little bit more conservative. Like yeah, picking your own stocks is risky. I like Wealthfront the way it's set up. Yeah, like when it shows like the projection. <clears throat> I like with Wealthfront the properties too. And everything yeah, in there. yeah. It's I like, like at this age, too. you'll be at this. 
I transferred assets out of there. I don't have it anymore, but I used to like I yeah. used to like it. I mainly it use it for gave the you a tracker. Big picture. Yeah. It was like a zoomed out picture. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it had your net worth on there too. Yeah, yeah. 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 Calculate your net worth. But sometimes it didn't really update that well. Especially with the properties. Yeah. Because they you like like connect it through Redfin yeah, or something. Yeah, you always had to connect the accounts and everything and every <clears> time yeah. you check. It was like those little things that'll be like, oh, I don't feel like doing with Yeah, this. exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But I since traded out of that. I'm no longer in wealth I'm no longer in stash anymore. I have a I have an advisor that uh, that those assets are being watched on, over. And then then I have a Robin Hood, <clears throat> which I started Robin Hood. It's like these are my short term holds. These are like That's your trap phone. My right quasi there. yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. My quasi like flips. I'm not, I've never been a day trader, but you know, uh maybe in a year, maybe in two years I'll I'll consider selling. Versus okay. like the E-Trade was a lifetime hold. So, but then Robinhood really has become like the same thing as E-Trade. Right. I think when you're investing, it's important to have as long of time horizon as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. The longer you're able to hold on to something, the more wealth that um, you'll create. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's funny because uh, a lot of my friends, when they have kids, I give them like, I buy them an Apple stock for their oh, birthday. Really? Yeah, oh, that's, that's like my thing. Like, mm. I'm like, it's affordable for me. I need to do that. Like and that. it's it's a uh, dope seeing it being like, man, I remember it was 120 bucks. Now it's like 190, mm. and like, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's like yeah. short period of time. Like, man, I can't wait to see what it turns to when they're 18. Like, and then like you know, compounding that each year and adding that little thing to it compared to like buying them some random toy or whatever it yeah. is. Like, that's not gonna get them much value out of it because they got enough toys already. Like, right. What's the point of that? So that's always been my little thing, and it's always fun like seeing that and. Even now, the way you can share it over Cash App or however. I was going to say how you gift them a stock. How you do that? So usually I before I would just send them the money and I'll tell the parents, like, buy them this. Let me see you buy it. Okay, you did it. Cool. Like, and they would have it in whatever portfolio they decided to do it in. Um, and then sometimes now with the Cash App thing, I'll just be like, I'll just buy it. And I'll just send it over as the stock. You know how you could send, send it to the gift parents? a stock or whatever uh, on Cash I App? I didn't know you could do Yeah, that. so you could do that on there. That's dope. So I'll just send it like that and be like, hold this for them. Uh, and then okay. do it that way too. Oh, so. That's cool. And then everybody, you know, some people have it in the Fidelity account or whatever it is, right, like different right. ways. So everybody's got their own ways on yeah. how they do it. My goal at the end of the day is just see them get something cool and let it grow. And yeah, <laughs> if it don't impact me that much, I'm like, this is fire. Like, yeah. you know, I think it's dope. Right. I mean, for me, bro, always coming up, like I was always a kid. I had secret stashes all in my room mm -hmm. you know i had some secret stash in my socks and i yep. had a secret stash with my pokemon cards and i had a secret stash under my bed in the little plastic toolbox mm -hmm. and i would put a little quarter here a dollar here you know and i'd spread the wealth out mm -hmm. and then you know you look at a secret stash and you're like oh i got i actually got some money in there so that's kind of how I, I still do it like and started doing that with the different platforms mm -hmm. i got money in different places and now with the properties and you know, all overall investments, really what I'm doing is diversifying. Like mm -hmm. as I was as a kid, it's also what I was doing. I was mm -hmm. diversifying my hiding spots. You right, know what I mean? Right. My my assets, my my streams of income. So you think uh with cause I knew you know how they always say classic, like uh what do they say? Millionaire, seven streams of income or something like that, like different investments or yeah. whatever. Like for me, it sounds like you got like over twenty or thirty different types of investments. Whether it's a little bit or a lot, whether it's a home or a stock or <laughs> yeah. portfolio here, portfolio there, like yeah. all those little things, whether it's angel investing, whether it's whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. What, what would you say? Because I, uh, I was thinking about that, too, like for myself. Well, I've heard I've heard both. I've heard that uh, millionaires always have seven streams of income. But I've also heard more recently that creating wealth is through building one asset one big thing and then selling it yep conserving wealth is through diversifying uh diversifying income streams mm -hmm. essentially mm -hmm. so like the income streams is is that's what helps you to conserve your wealth okay but the, to create your wealth it's building creating value in an asset that then you can either leverage and or sell and that's what every I, that's funny you say that. I feel like since COVID, maybe I would say I've been hearing that more. Yeah. A lot of people talking about the exit. What's the mm -hmm. exit strategy? Yeah, right. What's this? How do I get out yeah. of it? What? Are, how can I build this thing up to make it mm -hmm. worthy of selling? And who's gonna yeah. buy it? And all those stuff. Yeah. At least 
I don't know. Would you say that's about? No, that sounds. I mean, obviously, it's right. been a thing forever, but like. No, I think it's definitely more of the conversation now of like, what is your exit strategy, and um, you know, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna sell whatever it is that you're that you're building? Mm-hmm. You know, I think the seven streams of income, it could that can be dangerous if you're doing seven different things at a subpar level right versus doing one thing extremely well and then that thing when it be blows up and has true value then you sell it and then take the funds and spread them among those seven different things Mm -hmm. you know i think that's like the probably more accurate thought process but you know i'm a i'm a guy who likes to have a lot of different pots on the stove it's just yeah each thing has to make sense independently i'm like like, i'm like that too like I, uh, cause I don't want to feel like I didn't try it or like I didn't yeah like, damn, I should have did that. You know, like I yeah. want to be at least like, at least I got some type of skin in the game. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like it ain't my whole net worth going into it, but like, I want to at least say like, all right, I tried it. You know? Yeah. I think investments of capital was, I think it's fine to, I mean, I think you should diversify. Right. But when you're talking investments <clears throat> of your time and your energy yeah, and those resources that like you can't get back and you only have a certain uh, amount of them you know you only have a 24 hours in a day you only have a certain amount of energy to pour into something um that's when it's a little bit more dangerous to like spread yourself out Mm -hmm. so thin you know what i mean and so that for me is something that i battle against because i'm such an i'm an idea person i'm a creative person so when i have an idea i want to do it but you know i have to like be diligent about you know, we're working on this idea. And if this other new thing doesn't add to the project or make sense in the big picture of what I'm trying to build, then mm-hmm. I had to take a step back and put it in the archives. So with the, you would say you definitely pour more energy into like the creative agency and everything. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. like higher on the priority list right now. Yeah. That that's, that's certainly took taking uh uh precedent over other things. You know, I've slowed down on real estate. I've slowed down on, uh, you know, I still invest in, in stocks and, and other things. But <clears throat> as far as my time and energy goes, it goes to uh, Scarlet Creative and the B-Scar TV podcast. And for me, it was something that made sense to pour energy and time into while I was playing football because it couldn't, they complemented one another. Mm-hmm. You know, being a football player helped me in the creative lane. Being in the creative lane differentiated me as a football player, but also grew my brand Mm -hmm. as a football player. Mm -hmm. So they've poured into one another. And the whole thought process was like, let let me pour energy into the brand that is Brennan Scarlett, the story who is Brennan Scarlett on and off the football field, Mm -hmm. productize it in a way where we build a team and a service around doing this for athletes, helping brand, helping athletes build their brands, helping brands connect with those athletes organically. Let's create a business behind it. So then, you know, as soon as my time is done in football, you know, we can, we can go out to the market and we can, uh, service other athletes, service other, other brands. And it's fun. Cause you can still be like a part of the game. Still in the game. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like you still aligned with football and everything yeah. like that yeah like that was my that was my thing too i was like oh if i don't make it to the league i'm still gonna make league money mm-hmm. i just gotta figure out how to do it how to do it because yeah. it's not even like hanging with the homies that's made in the league or anything like financially it's more like i don't know it's always i was always like i never really wanted to be like a burden to you know how like make it to the league and then everybody just want like everything from you yeah and then you got to pay for everything you got to do all this and you're just like it's draining you mentally physically financially everything i'm like bro i'm trying to hang out do the same stuff i'm trying to go do all the same cool stuff yeah. like i'm in the league but i'm not like yeah. it'd be the same thing and that's my way of like i guess being aligned with it in some yeah. kind of sense right um still doing stuff with athletes still doing things yeah. but with yours is like a perfect alignment yeah like, oh, yeah, I could be still shooting this advertisement at the right. Super Bowl with so-and-so because they're yeah. one of my clients or whatever, yeah. and you're 45 years old. Yeah, yeah. I love – I mean, I love staying close to the game, and uh, I love the game. And and for me, it's uh, it, it's been an exercise, especially over the past, like, six months of not playing. Uh, it's been an exercise in figuring out what is it about the game that I love 
Mm -hmm. You know, what parts of the game do I want to carry with me through the rest of my life and into my career? And for me, just remember as a kid coming up, watching certain movies, you know, the Remember the Titans or like the Hoop Dreams or, you know, reading stories in Sports Illustrated or the holiday, uh, the holiday issue of East Bay mm -hmm. and reading the stories and like that shit just inspired me as a kid. And still to this day, like through my playing career, I've watched Notorious with Conor McGregor. Mm -hmm. I have it downloaded on my iPad, bro. I watch that before every game. Mm. Like the day before a game, I'm in the hot tub or the cold tub and I'm watching Notorious and just getting inspiration from the story that was his life. Mm -hmm. And whoever did that, that production, like was very intentional about using it as a vehicle for inspiration for other people. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, damn, <clears throat> I think that's where the game is so powerful because we can connect with each other through, you know, these inspirational stories. So let me kind of be on the side of like helping to tell those mm -hmm. for the athletes and for the brands, for the audiences. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's like building that ecosystem in it. I haven't fully under like figured out and coordinated how it's going to play out through the agency and production studio. But, you know, it's coming to life because I'm that's where I'm where I'm pushing. Yeah, it's it's dope too because like content itself is one of the fastest growing businesses out there. Yeah. And not only are you like pursuing something, but it's like you're about to be or you are in an arena that's like growing so fast. Sorry, like jetpack on We're this still shit. at the beginning of this stuff. It's crazy because people are like, Oh, it's saturated, this, that, mm -hmm. the other. And I'm like, bro. I've be seeing it. I'm like, we are still <laughs> Yeah, like, right, this right, is right. Crazy. We're spending more time consuming. Yeah. And it's like the phone is like, I don't know mm -hmm. what you consider it how it used to be, because they said like TV was the old radio mm. and the phone became the new TV. Mm. And da, 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 like, yeah. But it's just like, and it's also interesting seeing through content strategy now how people want more like raw, uncut, authentic content mm -hmm. compared to like real polished put together yeah um strategic stuff which uh, is such a shift it's shifting it used to be. yeah I, I would say definitely over like this past year mm -hmm. in particular yeah um and it's cool because it kind of takes a little bit of pressure off of yeah. creating the story and doing stuff because it's like let's just align organically and make this happen mm -hmm. instead of having to think too much and doing too much still yeah, yeah put out a good quality product but uh um, yeah that's interesting just take a little bit Something of the stress off about. a little bit and yeah. i've noticed that through my stuff too like i'm like man I'm not doing these crazy edits. I'm not about to overthink it. I'm not about to think about the title and the thumbnail, all the stuff. Like, I know it works. Let me go have a good time. Let me put right. some stuff together. Let me have some fun. Right. I'm not going to edit it crazy. Just put it out there. Yeah. And then it's like, boom, boom. This one's ranking. That one's ranking. I'm like, okay, this is a new era. Like, mm. this is what we're coming into now. Yeah. And people just want to see that. Yeah. I mean, when I first got into the content game, like, it was before Reels on Instagram. Like right. 2018 is when I really started leaning into content. I did a, uh, um, <clears throat> an internship at Complex Networks up in New York and I just saw they were a factory for content, bro. Yeah. And I was like, shit, I can do this. Mm -hmm. I can carry around a camera and have an editor and like start sharing my story that way. And having like a quality edit, other people weren't doing that. Definitely other like guys in the league. They were, mm -hmm. you know, putting out like a high quality edit. And so that's how I came up thing like high quality content uh but then now anybody can cook up a high quality reel right like right. it's more than norm. cameras then got cheaper and yeah. this, that, the, it's more the than norm to have a, 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 um, a high quality production than to just like take a video and just post it as mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. and it's it's really the story and getting people to want to stay to the end like the watch time the retention like I know that goes back to analytics, but it has a huge factor with like story. And it's like, do you want to watch this person from the beginning to the end of the yeah. video? Are you interested in them getting the outcome that they're looking for or whatever right. it is in that video? Yeah. And are they achieving that goal? And are they interested enough to watch the process of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the user generated content is good, man. It's got me thinking. You got me thinking now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's crazy. It's uh it's dope seeing, you know, the athletes definitely stepping in, especially with the, you know, college players getting yeah. in now with their content and everything. Yeah. And some of them like super like amateur when it comes to the type of content. 
Right. But you see it's going well. Obviously, like, you know, when you're in school, you got way more friends around you. So it's a lot easier to give viewership mm-hmm. and stuff. Because it's different being an adult out of school that don't go to school and see all your homies every day. Yeah, facts. Making videos for the internet. Like, facts. Because think about it. How many people you see in a single day? Like, that you know? Shit. Like five. You? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, Today, you? Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Like, I was like, oh, well, I mean, I guess I know the guy that I... That serves me at the restaurant that I like to go to yeah, every day, yeah, but like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? No, like, that's real. That's real. You don't really, especially in a remote like world. You know, for working remote, that's how it be. Yeah, it's crazy. Like, I got my few spots that I go to, and it's like, I see the guy at the bank, I see the guy over here, I see the lady at the grocery store. Yeah. Like, you see some college athletes cooking up on with content. Yeah, I think Colorado have in you, particular. You, oh yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, they've figured it. They're out. players or the or the players organization. Yeah. Okay players huh. i would definitely say tapping into some yeah i'm gonna tell you i'm gonna take a look they've done a good job on their youtube yeah like just kind of the behind the scenes putting it out there so you have a podcast of your own mm-hmm. and did you convert the whole channel to now just the podcast mm-hmm. okay so the whole channel is the podcast and then all the other production comes to it's created for other people other clients yeah okay yep. and then has the team grown or are you still working working like freelancers like what's the whole process? Um, so, my co-founder uh, Caroline and I, we're the core team at this point. We uh, the last six months, uh, we had a junior creative producer that came on, um, and then we had an, a junior account manager, um, Sophia and Dylan. Both of them are rock stars. Uh, we shifted a little bit, looking uh, at 2024, um, and really just trying to figure out how the business makes the most sense. You know, our overhead, our expenses, our sales pipeline, like how we're engaging and retaining clients. Mm-hmm. It's really a learning process, bro. Mm-hmm. And uh, the last six months were good because we had a, a really robust team, right? We were able to pump out Scar TV content at a high level, high quality. You know, we were buttoned up, but the business wasn't making sense. Mm. So now we've pivoted like, you know, when I say that, like, we're just losing too much money. Mm-hmm. So now we shift, you know, think about more so um, hiring people on a project by project basis. So, you know, as the opportunities come, then we're, we're dishing and throwing lobs for, uh, uh, for folks to work with us instead of trying to bring the folks in and um, kind of like creating the foundation for something big and then like trying to build that. Like, let's wait until something's big. At the same time, we'll kind of create our network of support. And then when we get those that opportunity and we're up to our ears and opportunity, then we'll bring people in and start dishing it off. You know what I mean? Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this would be like essentially the target is like for mainly athletes and creating their day-to-day content? No, nah, I mean – Or is it yeah. like special projects? Yeah. So how we – or position ourselves <clears throat> now as, as being the, the creative agency for the athlete. So in the same way that you have, um, that a, a professional athlete will have an agency for their contract, mm-hmm. an agency for their marketing, we're getting into a space now where you need to have an agency that handles your creative output. Okay. So what is your brand? How are you telling your story? How are you communicating that? How are you Okay. How are you actually executing and implementing your brand partnerships? Okay. Which, you know, the agency and the marketing group, they don't aren't as deep into that as I think there is room for. So I think there's a little bit of white space that Scarlet Creative wants to fill. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense because yeah, like definitely in the social media especially, like yeah. non commercial side, like it is just like wild wild west and so many different levels mm-hmm. even when it comes to like brand deals and pricing yeah like i could charge one brand seven thousand dollars for a thing and then i could get an offer for a thousand dollars from another brand mm-hmm. and i'll be like this is like the same type of work but like two different things would you do both of them it depends it really <laughs> yeah, depends we can't put you out there like on, that well it depends on seven thousand at least that's the floor for DNA right that's show. like the <laughs> we'll make it happen let's do it yeah, like, right. but it's it depends on like how much i walk with the band with the brand so yeah i just hired my uh assistant as my manager as well so basically 
like what she did in the past was like managing all my back end, email marketing and just the little stuff within the community and all the little mm-hmm. things like that for me. Uh, but now with the brand deals, it takes a lot off my plate with communicating and negotiating and making sure I'm not missing no opportunities and all those different things. Mm-hmm. Because especially with being a creator, sometimes you might get hit and they're like, hey, we got this last minute opportunity. We need to reply by tonight or tomorrow. And we got to have the content you know, idea done and ready and shot and first draft approved by Friday. And today's Wednesday. It happens sometimes. And it's like, damn, I saw the email next week. And I'm like, mm-hmm. ah, that could have been yeah. a dope opportunity. We're like, oh, you get to film with so-and-so and do this thing. So all those little things uh, kind of go along with it. I don't remember the initial first part we was talking about, but. Essentially, it's building the building. Oh, yeah. The Wild Wild West of it. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right, and right. It's, it's so interesting uh, how that works. So you guys are going to have to figure out ways to navigate the value of the creator, too. And their brand and what yeah. they're doing and then also yeah. like dealing with like egos of the person that you're working with i feel mm-hmm. like because they gotta humble themselves a little bit and realize like yeah just because you're so and so the way your content output is or the way your numbers are based off of viewership or something yeah. <clears throat> doesn't provide the same value that the brand right is uh looking for to yeah get the number that you want yeah and then you have to have that conversation with them or whatever it is to say, yeah. okay, here's the strategy to still make them make this thing work. Yeah. Yeah. And for us, I think, <clears throat> I mean, we've always operated on both sides of the table, right? So we'll work directly with brands because our bread and butter is being able to organically tell the story of the brand in collaboration with whatever athlete that they want to work mm-hmm. with, you know, because we've you know been crafted and came up in sport. And then on the other side, being able, also able to service the athlete, which kind of the proof of concept has been the work that we've done with with me and my mm-hmm. brand and, um, you know, across different channels from the agency, from the foundation, et cetera, from the podcast. Um, you know, so we kind of work both angles with the brands, with the athlete. And then for us, like internally, we also think about how are we going to tell our original story? So you know, being able to dig into long form content and, and produce and create and sell IP mm-hmm. is something that we want to build into. So it's kind of like a three, three headed monster in this, this triangle of, uh, of different business initiatives that we, you know, it's really this, this balancing act and, and trying to figure out what makes the most sense and remain in fluid enough to, um, to just shape shift into whatever that, that lane is that's driving the the fastest or makes the most sense. I feel like, and also uh, the project that you guys worked on, and maybe I just thought about it. The one uh, I helped y'all with filming, it was like the finance one y'all did for the kids in high school. Oh, that's right. Yeah, like it's yeah. dope because you guys are doing brand deals for stuff like that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, Explain how yeah. how it went. Yeah, that was uh that was Stash One Hundred One, Scarlet Creative, helped to uh, produce. Uh, this financial literacy coursework um, in Portland, inner city Portland, where essentially Stash 101, which is an offshoot of Stash, mm-hmm. uh, the fintech platform that we were talking about earlier, uh, they wanted to do some curriculum for some kids. We worked with the PIL uh, and this um, this like community youth group that they did, a youth program in the summertime. Scarlet Creative got myself, um, Dominican Sue, and his wife, uh, Katia Su, uh, together to essentially, this was the athlete in connection with the brand and through high quality production with Scarlet Creative. So it was kind of the connection of all the different things that we want to to work in. And for Indomitian, he's really uh, big on financial literacy and spreading and promoting awareness of the importance of financial literacy, him and Katia both. And so for us, it was like, this is something that aligns with Indomitian and who he is and uh, his brand. And then Stash 101 is trying to grow and build in this space. So, you know, let us kind of make the match and, and tell the story. Yeah. I think that is like a perfect example of, yeah, like, facts. you know, what you're doing. Because, yeah. I mean, I don't, you know, I haven't seen all the projects or anything, but I know mm-hmm. from being a part of that one in particular, I was like, damn, this is dope. Like, uh, it's yeah. fun to like feel yeah. and see the kids and then like learning from the beginning. You know, and they just there for a few hours. Yeah. But like, 
even from then, from the beginning to the end of the day, like seeing them already learning stuff and like, yeah, it's like, damn, their parents don't even know this stuff. Like you can hear them say like, man, my parents don't know this or they haven't taught me this or whatever. And now they get to go home and teach that. And you see in it, you know, at a younger generation, uh, having the impact. That was rewarding work for sure. Definitely. Okay. So, uh, you want to go deeper in anything or do you want to, what you want to do? What time is it? <clears throat> what we got here, man? 6.30. Chilling. I don't know, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm feeling good. How you feeling? I'm feeling good, bro. <laughs> I feel like, I feel like the conversation's been good, bro. Yeah. Um, You've had some, uh, some good people in here. Yeah, I'm honored to be on the DNA show. Shut your ass up! You know I gotta have you on. This is an honor, man. I looked at the lineup. You've had Henry Oregon. <laughs> You've had AC Aaron Cooper. Yep. You've had some goats on here, man. Gentry. It's a, it's, a, it's an honor to be in the lineup, bro. Yeah. Nah, bro. You you know I had to have you on. Um. Okay. Let's do the fire round then. Let's wrap it up. Okay, bet. Let's get out of here. Okay. Wait, actually, random question. Huh. You been watching any shows or movies lately? Yellowstone. Like Yellowstone. Yellowstone. And then I'm I'm I've just started a show that's fire, bro. What's it called? You gotta check it out. It's called Home. Home on Apple TV Plus. Mm, I gotta check it out. It's, it's like, it's a <clears throat> essentially it goes to these different cities to see these different homeowners slash designers and the homes that they live in. Okay. So there's one in Indonesia. There's a uh, one with Theaster Gates in Southside Chicago. There's an episode in Ghana with this guy, and it's well shot. It's well produced. The editing is incredible. It's an A24 production. So you know the A24 production studio. That, that's all you had to. You should have just told me that from the beginning. Bro, it is, and they're only like 30, 35 minute episodes. So they're easy, uh, easy to consume, and really inspiring. To see, because because they they follow these people. It's not just like an MTV crib. It's not you mm-hmm. know just looking at it. It's like they follow their lives. You know why why they're being so thoughtful. How mm-hmm. they're thinking about their design. How it you know they connect with the community. This and that and that. And bro, it's like inspiration just that's, comes to you, bro. That's funny you said it's that because nice. that is definitely a hundred percent up my alley. I feel like I didn't watch all the shows already that's on like Netflix and everything. So I'm like, check this one out. Ah, I don't got nothing else to watch. That's why I was asking. Home. Okay. I'm MT- definitely gonna watch yeah. it. All right. Fire round. Here we go. These are the questions that everybody asks me. So I gotta ask you. Okay, come on. How many pairs of shoes you got in your collection? 75. 75. Oh, that's solid. Okay. What is the most you spent on a pair of shoes? Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. What you got? Probably my Gucci boots. Oh, okay. Pull up in the Gucci boots. Can I get a <laughs> size sixteen? <laughs> Wait, you a sixteen? I'm a fifteen. Fifteen. Can I yeah. get a size fifteen in the Gucci? They was like, yeah, we got to go to the back for that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Special Gucci order. does a good job. They they're inclusive of the big folk. <laughs> a lot okay. of European brands are not. I feel that. I know. I'll be struggling with the thirteen. There's yeah. a lot of stuff. It's like twelve and under. Yeah. Okay. Um. Oh, what's the greatest shoe of all time? The ones. The Jordan, Jordan ones? Jordan ones, yeah. I got okay. a pair of band band ones that Ooh. are some of my favorite shoes. Okay. That's a good one. And last one, classic. If you go back, talk to your young self, 16, 17 years old in high school. <sighs> What would you tell them? It could be, you know, just reflecting. It could be a word of advice. It could be anything. What would you tell them? I would say, man, young B, number one, you're good, man. You're good. Um, the things that you want to do in life, the things that you want to pursue, the things that you want to become, The things that you are currently, it's all good. And live your life to the to the fullest and take the deep breaths in the moments that are are tough on you. When you hit your adversity, take a deep breath. When you have the good moments, also take a take a deep breath to stay and be Brennan Scarlet. Be Scar. Be. Be. 
B. Okay, now <laughs> can you hit the people with all your signature lines that you got on your other page? Um, this is the pursuit of high quality content, which is a never ending pursuit. Um, we say, uh, welcome to B Scar TV, and I have a very, very special guest, my dog DJ Willingham, <laughs> aka the DNA Show. Uh, one I just came up with. Uh oh. B Scar TV. This is the B Scar TV podcast where we are serving inspiration for lifestyle innovation through high quality conversation. He's out here rapping. <laughs> oh no, he's a poet. He's a poet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. All my, right, don't my tell little everybody. Soliloquy. Tell, <laughs> tell everybody where they can find you at Foundation. We'll have all yep. the stuff linked down below as well. Uh, websites, donation links, all the different stuff. We'll have everything for your socials, but Hell let yeah. them know. Appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> number one, the Big Yard Foundation. You can find us at bigyardfoundation.org. You can find me on Instagram. It's where I'm most active at b.scar. Um on YouTube at bscar TV. Um Twitter at Brendan Scarlet. I don't really use Twitter like that. Uh gotta get I'm on missing. TikTok, bro. Oh, TikTok at bscar TV or at b.scar. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Appreciate right, y'all. Hey, appreciate, appreciate you, it. man. Yes. This has been dope. Always. I, I love it. I feel like we're freaking either one of us are in or out of town all the time. So we're always like missing each other on stuff. But the thing is, man, sit down. The thing is, I gotta give you flowers, bro. You are the premier creator. I appreciate it. In Portland. For me to see what you've you've done, you're the definition of an entrepreneur. Throughout our our young days in elementary school and middle school, seeing what you, how you were flipping the sneakers, seeing how you created your website, you created your brand, you started creating content, the YouTube page, and not only are you leading the charge, but you're also looking behind you and, and giving back the knowledge. You're passing the knowledge back, and as many times you share with me tips and guidance and advice on how I should build my YouTube page. You've talked to other guys. I know Kendrick Bourne, you've helped Ken, you've helped so many of us. And I don't think you even realize probably how many of us that you've inspired to chase and to, you know, want to build our brands and our, our companies and, and you've done it. And so I appreciate you continuing to lead that charge and give it back, man. It's an honor being appreciate here in the studio, bro. For <laughs> real. I appreciate it, bro. Uh, what's the next event? You got an art show or anything coming up? <clears throat> yeah, Big Yard Studio will be in one. will be in May. That's gonna be dope. We'll have that Mother's Day weekend. We're okay. gonna have a, a Big Yard community hike okay. here soon okay. that we're hoping to be in uh, in collaboration with Arcteryx. Um, yeah, rocking the, the joint right here, a little Arcteryx jacket. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, but that that's what we got got coming. But this summer we're gonna be. Yeah, please send me the stuff early if you can because it, it's. I'll be like a few months yeah, out, so I gotta man, bro. lock it in, bro. I'm yeah. trying to make it. Yeah, I do. All right, bro. Let's get out of here. Let's, do let's uh, get back to our everyday lives and do what we gotta do and all them other things. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that follow button and uh, give a five star review on the platforms. And uh, what else is we supposed to say as podcasters? Give us some constructive criticism. Yeah, there we go. Give us some feedback. There we go. Because we're in the pursuit of high quality content, and it is an endless. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.